Kareem Hamazni here, and today we're going to talk about the principle of optimality, also known as optimal substructure. This is a very important property that problems need to have in order to be eligible for a dynamic programming solution. So, let's dive in. The textbook definition is a problem has optimal substructure if an optimal solution can be constructed efficiently from optimal solutions of its subproblems. In other more layman terms, we can solve larger problems given the solutions to its smaller subproblems. This was first coined by Richard Bellman, a computer scientist who literally wrote the book on dynamic programming in 1957. So let's take a look at a very simple example. Let's say we want to go from nodes A to C, and we have an optimal path. If that path has node B in the middle, then we know that the path from A to B is optimal, as well as the path from B to C. Let's take a look at an example that might not be so obvious at first. Here is a weighted graph that has distances between the nodes. Our goal in this problem is to get from node A to node J in the shortest distance possible. And by doing so, we want to get through the stages 1, 2, and 3 sequentially. So, let's try a naive, greedy approach to this problem. So, starting at node A, we're going to go the, the shortest path. And in this case, it's from A to B, with a cost of 2. In the top right corner, we'll keep track of our running, running sum. Now, at node B, we're going to want to go to node F, with a cost of 4. Then, from F, we're going to pick between 6 and 3. Uh, to, and we're going to pick 3 to get to node I. And then from I, we're going to go to J, with a cost of 4, giving us a total path cost of 13. Is there a better way? Let's take a look at some dynamic programming techniques that might show us a better path. We're going to illustrate the optimal substructure and dynamic programming with this, so let's dive in. So, let's define a function, f of x, and let that function be the minimum distance required to reach j from a node x. So, starting at the end at node j, we know that f of j is equal to 0 because there's no, no path cost to get to itself. Going back a level, we can calculate f of h and f of i, which we know are 3 and 4, simply based on the weighted edges. In our left side, we're going to keep a knowledge base with the actual costs of these functions. So I'm going to fill in f of h equals 3 and f of, a, f of i equals 4 on the left. Now this is where things start to get interesting. Going back a level, let's calculate f of e. f of e is going to be the distance between two options, either 1 plus f of h, which is a path cost of 1 plus whatever cost we've calculated for f of h, or it'll be 4 plus f of i. So it's the edge over here 4 plus the path cost of f of i. We know that the minimum in this case is 4, because 1 plus 3 is less than 4 plus 4. So we can now put that in our knowledge base and move on to calculating f of f. Here, we'll calculate the minimum again and we'll determine that f of f is equal to 7. We throw that in our knowledge base, and we move on to f of g, which is equal to 6. Going back a level more, we now have three options, as there are three paths, paths coming out of each of these nodes. So, we calculate the min 7 plus f of e, 4 plus f of f, or 6 plus f of g. We know that at f of b, the shortest route to get to f of j is equal to 11. We can throw that in our knowledge base and do the same for nodes C and nodes D. From node C, we can see the path cost of J is 7. And from D, we can see that the path cost of J is 8. Finally, we're at node A. Using the distances that we've calculated for F of B, F of C, and F of D, we can now calculate the total cost of the path from A to J. In this case, we found out that it's 11. This is definitely improvement over the 13 path that we discovered earlier through our naive greedy algorithm. Now, let's take a look at the path that it takes. We can go from A to D, D to F, F to I, and I to J. But this problem actually has another solution that has a path cost of 11. A to D, D to E, E to H, and H to J. So we've built an optimal solution, in this case two optimal solutions, using the subproblems to the problem. This problem has optimal substructure, but we want to define it using a proof. 
So we'll do that by using a proof by contradiction. We'll start our proof by saying let r a to j be the optimal path from nodes a to j, r being the symbol for the word root. Let's assume that this optimal path takes you through a city k. Our path can now be split into r a to k and r k to j. So let's look at a diagram for this. From a to k and k to j, I've put a squiggly line in between because it could go through other cities and it's not necessarily a direct path. So our first step is to assume that there's a shorter path from a to k. Let's call it r prime a to k and I've drawn it into the diagram above. If r prime a to k is less than r a to k, and notice that I use less than here and not less than or equal to because we could have more than one solution, then we know that r prime a to k plus r k to j as a total is going to be a shorter path than r a to k plus r k to j. But this can't be true. We already know that r a to k plus r k to j is the optimal solution as stated before. Therefore, r prime a to k, a shorter path from a to k, doesn't exist, and r a to k plus r k to j is indeed the optimal solution. This is proven by contradiction. Note, it's a good idea to do your proofs before you attempt a dynamic programming solution. That way you're not wasting your efforts in a futile attempt to apply dynamic programming to a solution that does not have optimal substructure. Now, we can also prove optimal substructure using proof by induction. So let's take a look at the example from the previous video for the Fibonacci sequence. For those that haven't seen the previous video, the Fibonacci sequence is a series of numbers where the next number in the series is equal to the previous two numbers. So 0 plus 1 is equal to 1, 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, 1 plus 2 is equal to 3, and so on. So let's start our proof by induction. In a proof by induction, we need to define our base case as step 1. Step 2, we state the induction hypothesis. And step 3, we perform the inductive step. And that's where the real work comes in. So in step 1, we'll just define our base cases as f of 0 is equal to 0, and f of 1 is equal to 1. In step 2, we'll start state our induction hypothesis. So we'll assume that f of k is correct for all values of k less than or equal to n. Now let's do our inductive step. From our inductive hypothesis, we know that fk, f at k is correct for the kth Fibonacci number. From our induction hypothesis, we also know that f of k minus 1 is correct for the k minus 1th Fibonacci number, because k minus 1 is less than n, and we've stated in our induction hypothesis that it is true for all k less than or equal to n. So what we want to solve for is f of k plus 1. So we'll continue our induction step. And by definition, we know of the Fibonacci sequence, we know that f of k plus 1 is equal to f of k plus f of k minus 1. So f of k plus 1 returns the k plus 1 Fibonacci number. Because we use lower values of k to solve higher values of k, we show that optimal substructure does exist. Therefore, this is proven to have optimal substructure. Dynamic programming techniques are now OK to use with the Fibonacci sequence. So once again, just to recap, we should use proofs to determine optimal substructure when using dynamic programming, because problems that don't have optimal substructure cannot be solved effectively with dynamic programming. Thank you for watching. Go to csbreakdown.com for more, subscribe to our videos, and like this. Bye.